Welcome, good afternoon, uh, beautiful July day. Uh, welcome to the Algebraic Combinatorics Seminar. Our speaker today is James Wilson here from Colorado State University, who will talk about nearly linear time isomorphism testing of groups of most orders. Okay, so if you grab the slides, you can scan back and slow me down, but also feel free to interrupt me at any point so that I know that you're, um, where you're stuck and maybe can help. Um, if you don't do isomorphism already, um, then this is my pitch to make you do only isomorphism for the rest of your research careers. And uh, so this is like a, a shameless plug, but no, it's actually more uh, the fact that as I've reviewed more papers and looked back at my old work, I've realized I should have a better context for why it is I'm working on it. It helps me sort of drive the direction of choices I make in terms of which pieces of isomorphism I'm thinking about or encouraging other people to think about. So I'm gonna take a moment to do something sort of high level, why this topic? I mean, there's lots of reasons that are great personal reasons to work on the problem. You could just be excited by it. It could be historically motivated. You might be solving some real world problems. But with something as abstract as group isomorphism, I think it deserves something stronger than just your, your general interests. Um, and so this is what I've come up with over the years of thinking about this problem and talking with other people about it who do it in a serious way. One of the main things that causes the need for isomorphism in any science, especially within mathematics, but certainly within any generic science, is that you don't really get information without making some choices. As soon as you have some data to look at, it's because somewhere along the way, the object you were studying, you assigned some vertices, some labels, you made a chart out of it, you chose some scales, and all of these choices are rather arbitrary. They may or may not reflect the data you're trying to actually understand. So once you've created some measurements of some object and created the data that you're actually gonna study, you might have actually created multiple versions of the same information. You might have taken the data and by your choices, you're representing the same information, but in different actual data sets. And this is where our equivalence classes matter. It matters to say, okay, now that we've collected this, how do we make sure that we put it back together as one unique object of some type? And so that's where you have equivalence, that's where you have isomorphism, the sort of fancy way of saying equivalence, is to get to the information that you really have. None of that has to do with anything to do with groups. I mean, you could just draw a map of the US and put pipes in water and water and, and come up with some object like that. So why group isomorphism? And I have to say, I'm sort of ashamed that it took me into this stage of my career to realize this sort of straightforward connection. Um, but I think now that I know it, I kind of want to tell everybody about it. So the main reason is the transitivity. If you have something that you say A is equal to B and B is equal to C, then A should equal C. And that feels like a very kind of relational question until you realize that, well, the way that A was equal to B was probably a function, like an isomorphism from A to B, but it's some kind of evidence that you could compose with evidence for another type, B to C, and then get an A to C. That's a multiplication. But at the end of the day, just the transitivity law alone, when you write it down in sort of more verbose language, becomes a product, just a biadditive product, uh, not a biadditive at all, but just a binary product. And reflexivity then is actually giving you this notion of their existent identity. So we have a binary product, it's associative, it's got an identity, and it ends up having an inverse because of the symmetric law. So once you know this, you can't unknow it. Like once you realize that the concept of an equivalence relation is actually just encoding a group or more generally a groupoid, you just sort of never forget that aspect of it. And that's actually maybe a better reason for why I should have been doing group isomorphism than all the actual reasons, which were things like, I found the problem interesting and then I spent time on it, it was successful in some cases and in other cases vexed me. So there's real life as to why I do it, but as I encourage new people to get into this, I would say whenever you're thinking of equivalence, you really are hiding a group somewhere. And then why group isomorphism? Why not say isomorphism of grass or of turkeys or whatever other object you might find interesting? Um, you do actually study other things. Graph isomorphism is a giant subject, but I think of this as sort of a level one comparison. I have my data sets and I compare them up to their relations. That's what a graph does. Now, once you've made that comparison, you may have answered your question, but most problems are actually really difficult to compare. And so you make some compromises and you say, well, equivalent up to a weaker version of equivalence, homology, homotopy, something that gets you out of the bind of comparing the data directly. It's way too hard to compare the data directly. So later on, you need to compare things at a level two granularity, comparisons between the comparisons. The best example I know of this actually occurred 
back in like 1905 with um, Dane, he was trying to compare two knots. The trefoil knots moved one way and the other way were really hard to distinguish by the tools available at the time. What he did is he created two groups out of them and they turned out to be the same group. There were these things called homotopy groups and he got the same group. So then that didn't tell him anything. Why is the left hand or the right hand different if you get the same data out of it? But then what he had the sort of audacity and brilliance to do was say, well, while they're the same groups, if I had an isomorphism from one to the other, it would have to reverse the order of things. So why don't I check if any other automorphism wouldn't reverse? And he found that no, every one of them reverses. Since every one of them reverses, they couldn't actually be isomorphic geometrically. So this looking at things at a second order level becomes where you end up looking at why are two groups different? And you can see this is a generic pattern. And from this you go, okay, now we're gonna invent some new object for level three or level four or level five. Well, that's not true. Because once you have a group, the next isomorphism problem is still a group, it's still a group. So at a high level, and in fact, there's, there's nice sort of write-ups of this in recent literature, what's really going on is that the base level is some, some data structure that you're comparing like graphs or hypergraphs or something, that gets you into the world of groups, and then the inductive process is just you group, group isomorphism one layer after the other after the other. So I'm replacing in my own personal goals this stronger reason of why the community at large has converged on these problems versus other isomorphism problems, say of rings or of Lie algebras. Those are great stories too, but they turn out to be less sort of functionally useful because they are not the inductive step in looking at equivalence. Okay, that's enough sort of high level diatribe. Let's get into a result you may or may not care about, but like the result of the, of the actual abstract. Okay, so the main result, in the simplest form I know how to say it, it would be this one. So the idea is, I'm not gonna tell you much about how I'm gonna give you a group, but let's just say that I give you a group, write down its multiplication table. I have an algorithm then that will decide if the group is solvable, and if it's got a pair of groups, decide if it's isomorphic to the second group in time that's nearly linear, okay? So what Heiko Dietrich and myself are working on is this very narrow nature of this question. We wanna compare two groups, we want them to both be solvable, and if they're solvable, be isomorphic. Well, we're not going to do that in general, and the reason is that there's a lot of theory out there already that's shown this is a hard problem. It's been around somewhere between 100 to 50 years, depending on where you want to put the starting flag, but it's certainly been around longer than most of us have been doing this kind of mathematics, so it's unlikely to think you're just going to pick a problem and solve it generically. So what are we working on as the best approximation before this result? For general groups, you had a group of order n, then you would have to work out n to the log n different steps to tell if the two groups are equal. So in this particular context, the way I've stated this problem, what Dietrich and myself have been working on is to make this now a nearly linear, which would mean an n squared roughly algorithm. So we go from n to the log n down to n squared. And that's a complexity win. It's practical to some degree, but We'll actually get into a little bit of slides later where we realize there's actually a much lower complexity, but you have to express the model much more verbose or much more compactly. Okay, so is the question clear? What I'm gonna be talking about today, are there any questions there? Well, I'm being thanked for the slides, so you're, you're welcome. The slides are available to you until the internet dies. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so let's get a little bit more accurate with the data structures and so forth that are necessary to make a claim like this. So here's the first version approximation. Oh, I, I neglected to say a keyword. I wanted to point this out because it's written on the slide, but I don't think I said it out loud. We're doing isomorphism testing solvable groups, but of most orders. So not every group is handled in this just because it's solvable, but it's the rich combination of solvable plus a particular type of order, which is prevalent that we care about. All right, so here's the first approximation to the general theorem. What we have is an algorithm that given these solvable groups actually solves it in this particular time, this exponential of O of log log n to the fourth. And if you know anything about log logs, you know that that's the result of number theory. I don't really understand deeply why so many logs show up in number theory, but I know how to read a book and quote that that's the number you're supposed to put there. So um, if you really push me, I'll say, this is the Brune sieve that's behind this double log here. Um, but the rest of it, I'm gonna sort of leave to sort of your own private reading, and maybe you'll tell me afterwards in the breaks and so forth. Um, but what we don't know yet is how we're gonna input a group, because if you think about this number, x of log log n to the anything, while that might be a big number for some n, eventually it becomes smaller than n, right? So this is a sublinear input. 
And yet you've got to read the data in. If the group has size n and you're writing a multiplication table, you can't even read the data in before you're out of time. So there's something subtle happening here, which is I'm electing to describe this in what's known as a black box model. So everything we're doing really doesn't care about how you write the group down. We'll write it down by the most compact definition you can have. And then we'll observe the timing in terms of the order of the group so we can compare it to the Cayley table model. But nothing in here really uses the Cayley table. It's just a way of exposing the information. And the second thing is I need to tell you what most orders means. So now here's the actual technical theorem. Uh, James, means. can I just ask a really stupid question? You, can, you uh, can ask a stupid one, yes. This is the first time I'm seeing that someone has a function around a big O. <laughs> yeah. This is, um, right, so I have the convention that I've seen others use, um, mm -hmm. but you have to be careful. So what you do when you want to sort of express that the leading constants matter or don't matter is you put a big O in front of the places you don't care about the leading constants. Okay. So here I'm trying to say it really is big O of an exponential function to some leading constant. Well, since there's a leading constant in the exponent, then whatever, whatever base I choose and whatever scalar, that would also be in the noise of the big O that's in there. Yeah. So roughly speaking, whatever function I have, if you took the log of it, it would be O of log log n to the fourth. Okay. So it is technically correct to write this, but I have to admit, this is not what you'd find in sort of your elementary textbook with big O. Uh, but yeah. you find yourself in the need to sort of explain what you're doing, and too many O's makes this unreadable. I mean, this is almost unreadable as it is. I don't know how to make it shorter with the double logs, but, but absolutely. Yeah. Point. Did, did anybody want to have any more? explanation of what I just answered Alexander with. Okay, we'll bring it up. If, if, if I've lost you, um, feel free to ask because I, I don't need to speed through this in any way. Thank you. All right. So the formal theorem is this. What we're going to say is that a set of integers is dense. If you pick a random number n, it has probability one of being in the set as n gets large. Okay, so you're going to miss some numbers along the way but it's dense in the formal limit sense. You take the size of the set omega, truncate it at some size n, divide it by n, and that limit goes to one. So eventually most primes, or most numbers show up in this list, okay? Then in this setting, we're claiming that we have a deterministic algorithm. That means we don't roll any dice. Everything is done by a procedure that follows a specific set of steps that given to black box groups, with known factored order, this is very irregular. Normally you don't know the order of a group if it's given by something very terse. If I give you a couple of matrices, those could multiply out to some huge group. So how do you know? So this is just the hypothesis. We're saying in our hypothesis, we're assuming that the order is known and that we factored it. There's ways to make that possible. You can have what's called gray box or you can have a factorization oracle. There's things you can do to make this a different set of inputs. But just for today, I'm gonna to make that the declaration of my input. And then these algorithms will first of all decide if the group is solvable. And once they know that it is solvable, it'll compare it to another solvable group and decide if they're isomorphic. And I'm careful to say the word decide because I'm not gonna say perhaps commit to giving you an isomorphism explicitly between G and G prime, meaning that I'm willing to allow myself to use group theory to know these things are isomorphic, even if perhaps I don't wanna put the computational work into building that said isomorphism. And this is one of those things that is really tricky because in the world of um, complexity, there's a problem called search to decision, which is if you have a problem that just says yes or no, you can sometimes use that to actually find an answer. Linear programs are a good example. You have a linear program, it's a set of constraints and you wanna find a solution to it. Well, if you just have something that says there is a solution or not, you can do a binary search to actually rebuild the solution from it. So there's no difference complexity wise from knowing there is a solution to having a solution. But with group isomorphism, that's an open question. We do not know if you can just decide two things are isomorphic, whether you will be able to rebuild an isomorphism explicitly. And this is of the nature of deciding isomorphism, possibly without an actual isomorphism. And that's already something that's irregular for the subject area. And then the last thing I put in blue is to sort of emphasize it is that the deterministic here depends on a whoppingly hard problem called the extended Riemann hypothesis. I have no idea the status of this, except that it's still open, but I don't know if it's considered true or false. So at some point in the world, people thought it might be true. And so they proved theorems based on assuming it. I'm doing the same thing here. If I'm wrong, that's kind of okay, right? Because then I disproved one of the millennium problems and uh, you know, that has its own benefits. Um, but 
if you don't like assuming a hypothesis like that in the middle of the theorem, two things come to mind. For one, in the Cayley table model, we don't need that. We can remove it. And also, you can replace this with a Las Vegas polynomial time algorithm, meaning you do roll some dice and you don't make an assumption of the generalized Riemann hypothesis. Okay? So I, I don't know the status of that, but you can certainly um, spend time with your favorite number theorist friend and have them tell you what you should think about it. With that all in mind, you then put on the assumption of a Cayley table and you'll get the same result that I had on the first page. So the dense set is this set that I haven't described yet, the set Upsilon. We'll come to what those numbers are, but once you have those numbers, then you get an isomorphism test with this running time. Okay. Now, I'm not going to go through these related results, but I'll say that this is, as with many isomorphism tests, what you do is you solve a bunch of other isomorphism tests and you glue them together to make the one you're really after. But sometimes those little shards of smaller isomorphism tests that are left behind become sort of interesting on their own right. And I've collected them here for anybody who wants to see them. Um, I'll slide into just one, just to give one definition. So if I was to put the word abelian on here, so that's a much smaller family than solvable groups. But if I said abelian and I tried this whole algorithm out, I would get to this much, much better complexity. And that seems fair. It's an easier family of groups. You should run faster. So what's lost here is they don't have an exponential in the front. So this is just literally the log of the order of the group to some power. It's, it's what's known in a, in a very formal sense as polynomial time in this input size. Um, but what I want to draw your attention to is a partial definition of the set of numbers that are most for the purpose of this talk. So I'm going to start out with this smaller set than the one we'll, or sorry, this larger set than we'll eventually use, and it's what we call pseudo square free. So a number n will be called pseudo square free if whenever there's a prime that occurs more than once, so p squared or higher divides n, then that prime is tiny. So it's less than log log n. And in fact, p to the e that divides n, whatever power of p divides it, is less than log n. This is a weird number. It's, if, if your number was square free altogether, you would just say square free. But here what we're saying is you can have small primes accumulate as long as they're small, log log n is small, and their powers are also small. Now, as a group theorist, I would never have thought of these numbers. But apparently, if you ask a number theorist, they would say, oh, you just mean a number. What I mean is, this is what most numbers actually look like. You know, a generic number, if you imagine your number, you might have 2 to the 700 in your favorite number. But if you picked a random one out of an urn, it would look like this. It'd be pseudo square free. Anyway, so there's other results here you can take a look. I won't go through them. So here's our plan, our plan to prove this, this um, isomorphism test. Our first role is going to be separate concerns. So as you can tell from the kind of hypothesis we have, we have some number theory. You know, I, I'll say number theory, but of course, I really mean sort of elementary number theory or 19th century number theory. And this is in class groups and all the hard stuff. This is you know, stuff you could get out of books that are there, but I'm going to still call it number theory. And then there's the first concern we're going to have is to do this little trick here. We're going to try to come up with a condition on a number n such that whenever you have a group of order n, then the group is a split, meaning a semi-direct product, of a subgroup H and a subgroup B. And I'm going to name them that way with the intention of trying to remember what roles they play. So H is the subgroup that has all the hard group theory. And B is the subgroup that has all the bad numbers. Okay? Now, hard and bad are somewhat similar, but I have to separate them. This is, this is how we did it. Or maybe B is for big primes. You can think of it that way. So there's two things that are going on when you're trying to study a group. You could have some difficult, complicated group theory of how things are extended, how P's act on Q's and so forth. Or you could have some really crazy number theory, you know, how one thing divides another. And if you are unfortunate enough to have a group which is both hard group theory and number theory, well, then you're stuck. You're not going to learn a thing about it. So our hope is to design numbers n where you can at least separate and do the number theory on one side and do the group theory on the other side. If you have these two separate concerns, you might have a fighting chance to prove something in it. All right? But that's not where we finish. That's the starting point is to split the group into hard group theory and hard number theory. So now we have two hard problems. It seems like, well, we didn't make much progress, except now we do this sort of funny role reversal. What we do is we take the hard group and we hand it to the number theorist. And we take the hard number theory and we hand it to the group theorist. 
with what in mind? Well, the number theorist takes a look at our group, and they don't have a single group theory tool in their mind. So they just look at the numbers in our group. And they say, well, what are you worried about? Because all of these numbers are tiny. All the prime powers are tiny. So who cares how hard your group is? It's tiny. So your group theory is hard, but it's tiny group theory. Do whatever you want, brute force. And the group theorist takes the number theory part and says, I know your numbers are terrible, but your group is cyclic. So what are you worried about? It's a cyclic group, it's easy. So we split it apart into the hard number theory, the hard group theory, then we swap who gets to look at it, and they both look at it from a different lens, and they realize actually both problems are easy. Either it's easy group theory because it's tiny, or it's easy number theory because it's a cyclic group. Like, we don't have to worry about either case. And that's basically the whole talk. But of course, the difficulty is finding the end that does this and convincing your number theory friend that these things are tiny and convincing your group theory then that things are cyclic and that you're going to be able to glue it all together. So I'll spend the rest of the talk convincing you that there's something harder going on, but really that's the whole thing. We've just done the whole process right there. Okay. Are there any questions here? All right. So let's get into the first side of this. What happens in the group theory side when you have these number theory assumptions? How do you use those assumptions to help you out with the group theory? In particular, how do we first break up the group as an H and a B, a split decomposition? So here we have to get our definitions uh, in gear. We'll say that a prime P that divides N is isolated if whenever there's another prime power, say Q, such that Q to the K divides N, then P does not divide Q to the K minus one unless actually K was zero, meaning there wasn't a Q to the K to begin with, okay? So either you don't have a large other prime power dividing it, or if you do, then P and Q sort of don't talk to each other. Let me say this in a slightly different way. This definition of P dividing Q to the K minus one, let's write it with mod notation. We would say Q to the K is congruent to one mod P. And anyone who's taken a course in group theory knows that equation comes from Sievo's theorem, right? The fundamental thing that matters right now is to have the Sievo subgroups do something special. And with this assumption of isolation, we get the following lemma. Every solvable group G of order N, and for every isolated prime divisor of that order, G immediately has a unique Sievo P subgroup. Unique means also that it's normal. It means a lot of other consequences, but this is the key step towards breaking the group up. So let's try to give a, a sketch of the proof here um, with a little bit of solvable group, group theory assumed as an oracle. I can refer you to references if it's, if it's interesting to you. Uh, but some time ago, uh, Philip Paul studied, tried ways to make generalizations of CELO theory for groups, and he got as far as making them generalized to solvable groups. And one of the things he discovered is what we now know as a, uh, as a silo system or a Hall system, depending on the context of what I phrase this, but it's the idea that if a group is solvable, then you can find silo subgroups. There may not be a unique choice, but you can choose a P1, then a P2, then a P3. Each of these are silo for different primes, such that the group is actually a product of these subgroups. Now remember, in, in groups, the product is not even necessarily a subgroup, right? They're, they're just some subset. So to make the whole group be a product of these silos is already saying something, and such that they pairwise permute, meaning they actually, the PI and PAGA do actually make a subgroup. So this is a rare situation, and solvability lets you pull this off. Now, if we have an isolated divisor P, it's one of these silo subgroups. Somewhere in the list is the P that we're interested in, the one that's isolated. So what we're gonna do to sort of prove that that one's normal is that we'll pick some other one, PI, and look at how it acts on the PU. And what we do is we just count silo subgroups inside of this group of order P to the I, Q to the J, right? So we have a two prime situation and we look at how the congruences have to work. And because of the assumption of isolation, we know that there can only be one solution to P Q to the K congruent to one mod P and that's the trivial solution. So that means that the P group in that situation is normal. And once it's normal, then you just sort of do an inductive thing to move all the other elements around and you end up with a normal subgroup of the whole group. Okay. Now, if that went too fast, the point was to sort of illustrate that actually the ideas are all sort of 
in that elementary nature, like once you've sort of studied some of these CELO theory, you can start to see how to play with these toys and build up a theorem that will split things up. So I just wanted to illustrate that. And the consequence is we get our first splitting theorem. So what we're gonna do is take all the isolated prime divisors of a number n, we'll stuff them into a set called pi sub n. So this is just a set of prime numbers that have that isolation property. Once we have that isolation property, we just saw that every CELO P subgroup for a P in that set happens to be normal. And so what we'll do is we'll collect each one, one after the other after the other, into one big subgroup B. And because each of them is a normal one, then the product of them is normal, and the larger the lo we get, we eventually get to this group B, which is normal. And in fact, it's even better than normal. Its order is relatively prime to the quotient of, its, of that subgroup. So it's relatively prime as an extension, that's called co-prime. And because of that, it actually splits as a semi-direct product. That's a theorem of short zazenhaus You could also prove it with other tools in the case of solvable groups. But there's, there's group theory tools out there that immediately break your group apart. And in fact, it even shows that that choice is, in, is not necessarily unique, but it's unique up to conjugacy. You can always choose a different H and you'll find a conjugating element to it. And B is also no potent. So that's a, that's a good amount of structure to start out with when we separate it. And the result is that we've split up the group based on just a number theory condition. This isolated prime condition has pushed everything that's bad number theory into B and left everything else in H. Okay. Any questions about how we got here or what, if you've lost a definition somewhere? Okay. So having broken up, we've achieved the first goal, which is to split the group up into these two parts where the group theory in H might be hard and the group theory in B or the number theory in B might be hard. Now we're gonna swap the two roles and see what happens, okay? So let's think about what's happening in these isolated primes from the perspective of number theory so we can understand what's going on. So here's the interactive portion of our talk, I suppose. Um, ask yourselves, or you can put it in the chat if you're brave enough, what's the 1,000th prime number? in this list. So everybody hopefully has either gotten their dinner or they've made a guess at this point. Um, oh, there's a vote for C, okay. Any other votes? There's another A. If we get them all, then somebody's right. So, so all right, well, we have A and C as our votes. Um, it's A. Now, why would I do this little experiment? I do this with my students in, um, when I'm teaching undergraduate classes, especially. Uh, I want to demonstrate something that I think you can say and not really believe, which is that the density of primes is large. Right? The prime number theorem tells us exactly how large, but that's not really a number that I think about. I don't think of pi over log n as a number. But I do think of 7,900 as a number. And when I think of that, that means that roughly one in eight of all the primes up to 8,000, um, all the numbers up to 8,000 is prime. Now, if I was hunting for gold and every eighth day I found a nugget, I would stop being a mathematician and be a gold miner. That is great odds. And the premise here is that there are so many primes that when you take a number and you factor it into primes, you're going to hit a different one almost every time. Random numbers have so many primes to pick from because there are so many primes that they don't accumulate large powers of the same prime. And this is so backwards to my training as a group theorist. Because if I think back to the group theory that I used to do, I spend so much time on groups like dn or d8, which have these big powers of two in them. And you study what that big power of two does and you think that must be important. But from a number theory perspective, you should expect two to show up once or twice and never again. And so to say that in a more forceful way, group theory was more or less halfway done by 1890. Because in 1890, Holder had already worked out what are all the groups of square free order. So he worked out that if you have a group that has no repeated primes, then it's actually just an extension of two cyclic groups, Z mod A and Z mod B. And at least by the time of Hardy, I don't know who really would have studied this first. I'm not a number theorist, but I've chased it at least back to this level. It was understood that these are basically two thirds of all numbers are square free. 
It's one over a zeta function and so forth. You can count it more precisely, but the point is there, there's a lot known about square free and cube free and fourth free numbers, and they quickly saturate and become almost all numbers, almost right away. And yet, if you look at the group theory, this would be the, you know, if you're teaching a course on group theory and you spend more than like one day's lecture on ZA mod ZB, you're doing something wrong. You're not teaching group theory at that point. You would feel like it, right? This seems like such a basic group. And yet, when it comes to the kind of group that you might stumble upon in a dumb application, it has every right to be as likely that it's just two sigma groups. And so, surprisingly, this might be a place to really spend some time thinking when you're looking at an isomorphism problem. You expect groups to come across with some random order. It might just be this simple. So with that in mind, this pseudo-square free definition that I hinted at earlier was to say, let's push all the primes that occur a lot of powers down below log n. So if a prime occurs as a square or a cube or something, we push that down to being a small prime with a small power. And all the big primes that occur only once go in the other side. We now realize that's actually what most integers do. So this decomposition of pseudo square free is actually just looking at basically your typical number. Now that doesn't make it square free, but it makes it, um, hold on. Birds. <laughs> okay. This is a, you can read the, ch the chat joke if you wish to. Um, uh, but yeah, so the point is here that, that pseudo square free is already capturing most numbers. And now we're going to just sprinkle in just a little bit of extra. We're going to put this isolation condition. We want the primes to have this isolation condition. If you remember the isolation condition up here, oh, over here, it's that you have these two magic primes where one divides the other one in a specific way. Well, again, there are so many primes to pick from. Good luck expecting that to happen very often. And so what we prove is that, in fact, you don't see that many numbers that don't have almost all their primes being isolated. Certainly all the big primes, anything bigger than log log n, is basically isolated. Now, I would love to tell you that, you know, I just sat down on a Saturday and I called up Heiko and then, you know, over a quick Skype chat, we just found this. Uh, the reality is a little bit more that we searched and found that people like Erdos, who really understood lots of things and connections with numbers and groups, had already given us a huge head start. They were looking at something uh, related to why do groups have direct factors based on their order and uh, related to something called the Bruin sieve to do the counting. We looked at that and said, we don't need half of these things. We can clean this up and look at a simpler set of numbers and, and we got our proofs. Um, from understanding that work. So we take credit for simply reading, well, than, than typing. Okay. So if you kind of lost track of what things mean, here's a summary of what we need to know about the number theory at this point, the main things to remember. We're gonna focus on just those numbers where a large power of a single prime dividing n means that that large power is actually less than log n. Okay. So lots of group theory can happen there, but it'll all be of tiny groups. So it's less scary all of a sudden. And conversely, if you have a prime that's bigger than log log n, well, then it's an isolated, meaning that there's not much group theory for it. If it shows up, well, then basically it can only contribute to like a cyclic factor. It doesn't do any group theory. And that's exactly the thing we said was our main goal. Our main goal was to take our group, split it up into an H and a B, hard group theory, bad numbers, and then swap who looks at them. So the number theorists look at our groups and say, these are tiny groups, so why are you worried? And the group theorist looks at the numbers and said, these are cyclic groups, why are you worried? So now we're not worried. So now we try to give you the algorithm that you'd actually you know, cobble together. There, there might be other strategies to do this, and it would be actually interesting to see if there's a cleaned up way to do this, but we have to do this in various steps. So without trying to scare you, here's the algorithm in its parts, okay? So no, you don't have to read this whole slide, but the, you know, fragments of different problems get solved as you go along. And if you've read papers in computational group theory, you've seen that you often build up with these sort of inductive structures and sort of general strategies. And that's really where we're, we're pulling in that same type of thinking as we do this. So I'll, I'll just break through a few of these to give you a flavor of what it means. If anything has an MO at the end, that just means most orders. Whatever algorithm we're concocting, we're gonna go ahead and use the properties of the ends that we're interested in. And what it might mean on numbers outside that set, we're not even gonna worry about. I mean, it'd just be slower is what we would say. It's not like it wouldn't work, it'd just be, well, actually some of them might not even work, I don't know. But MO means definitely look at one of our sets, of C or Upsilon. 
So the abelian part is where it's number three. This is the part where you have these really bad, scary numbers. And to convince you that they're really bad, scary numbers, I put in words that you would find in, say, a cryptography course, things like factoring integers or discrete logs. These are actually the problems that are right there in our isomorphism problem. Right front and center, you have to factor, you have to do discrete logs if you're going to do a Beeling group isomorphism. It's just kind of a natural consequence of it. And we have proofs in our paper that sort of show how these reductions go. And it goes back to um, Iliopoulos and others that have shown, um, Bob Isamoretti, many people have shown that hard number theory is hidden inside of group theory in general. So you have to be cautious how you state things. But we claim that we can do this, which means that we're going to do this assuming this most orders convention, that when we get to bad number theory, it only contributes a cyclic group, and that gives us an escape hatch that you don't normally have when you're doing these theory. Um, by the way, I didn't say this, but I, I should mention this for those who are computational group theory people. Um, you don't have to care about group isomorphism to use this strategy. This idea of breaking a group into a hard part that has small bits and a bad part that's cyclic, you can use that as a black box sort of building block. You can take any question you want. You want to find silo subgroups, you want to find direct products, you want to find centralizers. All of those questions naturally break up through that structure and become easier because you don't have to worry about the big primes anymore. You don't need discrete logs in your algorithm because you push them off to the B and then the B was cyclic and you don't have to worry about it. So, it might be something to explore in a more general context. Uh, just leave that out there for those who are in that field. In the abelian context here, 30% of what we do is just the obvious abelian thing to do, right? You have some abelian group, you should obviously do some sort of break it up into primary components and so forth. The, the things you would find in homework exercises. We do about that for most of it, okay? And then the rest of it, we just cite like mad from really smart people because we're not number theorists, right? So the point is that there are people who thought very deeply about discrete logs and factorization and Hermit normal form efficiently. And uh, you don't have to do that much work on your own with this long subject matter. You can just go find out what people have done and glue it together in the right ways. And you'll get to roughly here. So here's the digested version of the abelian groups context. Um, I won't tell you what a basis is, but you can imagine that if I write a group in primary decomposition, you have a bunch of cyclics for various prime powers, take a single generator from each one of those terms, call that a basis. So then the first extended discrete log problem is that if I have an element in my group and I have already worked out a basis, well, that doesn't mean that the element is written as a linear combination in my basis, right? I got to make that step happen. And even the word linear combination assumes that everything is being written with a plus and a scalar. But groups don't have scalars. Groups just have the multiplication, just the plus. So how are you going to get the scalar? You know, roughly speaking, you just exhaustively add several times in a row, right? And then you start to realize the size of the group becomes a big problem. So getting these exponents, E1, E2, E3, that are the linear combination coefficients for your element is really hard without just brute force searching. And this is what's known in, in the context that we're in as the discrete log problem, if it's in the case of cyclic, and the extended discrete log problem, if it's an acyclic abelian group. So that is a hard problem. They base cryptography on that. So let's not be too hopeful that we're going to do that. So what we'll do is we'll restrict our attention to that situation, but only on the small, small pieces of the group. So we have all these hard group theory things, but with tiny, tiny primes. That's where we use the extended discrete log. We won't need it on the big primes. So that makes it easy. One abelian recog, this is just an isomorphism test, but to a very specific natural form. Since the abelian groups are classified, we know what to look for. And so we can write a specific choice of the domain, z mod n's, for various values of n. But I want to clarify, this is only one way. I did not promise you the inverse to this isomorphism. And this is where that thing I mentioned earlier, that this is a decision but not a search problem. Will this side two groups are equal? without necessarily giving you an invertible transformation between them. And that's because at the abelian stage, in order to avoid a discrete log, we simply only give one way of the isomorphism. And this is made possible by the fact that the number theorists gave us this big complex B, and the group theorists told us it was actually cyclic. Being cyclic means all I have to do is match up a generator of the same order. And I don't have to worry about how you invert that. That's a discrete log problem. But as soon as you've matched up the generators, it is an isomorphism. So that's what we've done is we've cheated, but we you know, fulfilled the, the breed. And so when we get to comparing two groups, G1 and G2, 
we simply have isomorphisms in one direction from a canonical representation into G1 and from a canonical representation into G2. Therefore, there is an isomorphism, but good luck getting it. It's at least discrete log. So this is kind of a one-way function thing. If you're, if you're into cryptography, we're, we can't compose two one-way functions and get a non-one-way function, right? So. Uh, James. Yeah. Um, is, am I right in understanding that um, that means for the, the you know, quote-unquote Cayley table model result of n squared poly log n, that in that time bound, you actually can do yes. solve the search problem? Right. Discrete log is not a problem in the Cayley table model. So then it's completely constructive and so forth. So it's not a search decision for the Cayley table model. Yeah, it's only a black box one. So I, I probably oversold the difference here. No, no, but but I'm I'm also asking. I guess is this the only place where you're you're not doing the search? Problem? Well, yes, but that's because it's a base case. But other inductive steps use this in layers. So to say it's the only place is to say it's the only place that it actually occurs. But then it occurs recursively. So how that looks when you glue it all together, I, I don't know. Okay, thanks. Moving up to nilpotent, I don't actually want to spend too much time on this except to point out one piece, which is you've got to get this B somehow. And the good news is, is that what we have is that the hard group theory is a bunch of tiny primes, which means that you can step down doing sort of very simple group theory to sort of give yourself a composition series all the way down to the big prime thing. And the big primes are recognizable, which is a technical word to say, you will know when you're in the big prime set. And that's because they have these very obscure patterns, of, oh, sorry, these very specific um, orders, these huge primes divide them. So you can decide whether you're E and B because you have a normal Hall big prime subgroup. So you know when you're in there, therefore you can work in the quotient G mod B. It's a black box group and I can make, and because it's all pr small primes, I can do an enumerative process to get a full composition series and get a presentation for that whole group. Once I have a presentation, I evaluate the generators, I get generators for the group B. Well, now you're thinking, oh, no, no, he's going to do a normal closure. That's Monte Carlo. The whole thing's going to fall apart. But it's normal closure in a cyclic group. You don't need to do anything. There's already a generator in a cyclic group. You don't have to take conjugates of it. You've got it. So there's no Monte Carlo closure in that either. So you get this B from that. And in the nilpotent case, then it's sort of straightforward from there. You power things off, and you go prime by prime for your isomorphism, brute force if you're necessary. But the, the main point is getting the decomposition. And that technique didn't even need nilpotent. I just mentioned nilpotent. I put it on the nilpotent slide. So you can find the B in any situation. Now the workhorse, the place where like the, there is a place where the group theory and the number theory do have to do a little bit of a dance together. And it's really right here. It's those groups of Holder, these metacyclic groups, the ZA acting on ZB, right? You have two cyclic groups, co-prime order. They're acting on each other. How do they become isomorphic? And the answer is, boy, it turns out, like, you know, if you think deeply enough about ZA mod ZB, you realize that actually could be a whole course in group theory. Those are some subtle groups, like the way that numbers work on each other. It's, it's not easy. Um, but what you do is you work on the A side, because in the A side, all the prime powers are small, very small, right? That was the limitations of the number system we have. B is huge. Don't touch it. But A is small. And fortunately, A is the one that's acting on B, which means it's acting inside of the automorphism group of a cyclic group. We know lots about that. In particular, we can reduce the question of isomorphism completely to the following somewhat simpler sounding question. When do two representations of a cyclic group inside the automorphisms of a cyclic group have the same image? And if you work that even down to the powers of a prime, so if B has power Q to the F and Q is prime, then that automorphism group is cyclic. And then in fact, they're equal if they have the same order because cyclic groups only have one group of any order. So then this gives us this somewhat, I, I mean, I, I, if there's a place where I'm most proud, it's this deconjugate. We, we worked hard on this one. It, it seems obvious until you have to do the number theory yourself and you just sort of play with it. But if you have two cyclic groups acting on each other co-primely and all you have is an oracle that tells you whether they're equal. So you can do X or Y to the X and check, is it equal to something else? Then in polynomial time, in honest polynomial time, like log n to the constant, you can actually find the k that's equal to that conjugacy. So it's deconjugating in the sense that we knew that it's in a cyclic group. So y to the x is some power of y. And you would normally just say, well, do a discrete log here. 
just run a discrete log and find the K for whatever that element is. But we can't use a discrete log because these are gigantic primes. We can't touch the B side. And yet we recover K because we work on the A side, which has only small primes. And so by delicately walking it through the cyclic structure there, we end up discovering the K by doing piatic expansion of the K, little by little, and GCDs. So it's a Chinese remainder theorem, piatic valuation, hence a lifting combo. Okay, it's a nice piece of mathematics is all I'm trying to say. Solvable groups. Well, now we've done the bulk of it. We can split the group off in H, sorry, we can, we can find the subgroup B, we can deconjugate once we have these things, and if you think of the metacyclic, then when you go to polycyclic, you're just gonna iterate polycyclic one after the other. But there's a catch, you've gotta kind of do this in an order that doesn't build up the complexity. One after the other can sometimes multiply and sometimes add. So here comes the last sort of silly tricky bit. What we have to do is that as we're coming through inductively, trying to move one composition factor, which is cyclic, down to make the decomposition H and B, we have to be careful that sometimes those cyclic factors centralize and sometimes they don't. If they don't, and then later one centralizes, then we wanna do a Jordan Holder where we swap the position of those two terms, but without recomputing anything, because then it's a backtrack and the things will explode on us. So the proof takes many, it's a nice little journey through case distinction of if you're here, then you do this, and if you're there, you do this, and if this centralizes that, you go through here. But at the end of the day, all we're really trying to do is say, as you come down cyclic by cyclic, if you um, centralize, you wanna move that underneath the part that doesn't centralize, but without recomputing anything. That's the, the subtle idea that's going on there. And once you've broken it, you're back to the small group theory, you brute force the H, you solve the deconjugate to get the full lesson lines. Okay, so I'll, I'll pause there and ask any questions. I have only a couple more slides to go, but I, I know I rushed some of that um, perhaps, so perfectly fine to, to back me up. Okay, well now I'm gonna try to pivot towards looking forward a little bit, just a little bit forward into the future. It's really nice when you have a number N and you can separate the hard group theory and the bad number theory in the way we've done. And then just deal with those as separate problems and find successfully that it works. But there is a group of, oh, sorry, there's a family of groups out there where this doesn't work. And they're known as simple groups. Simple groups are the place where bad number theory gets together with bad group theory and makes a disastrous combination. So, how to make this work without the word solvable in the, in the theorem, right? We said we can do isomorphism of groups of most orders, provided they're solvable. Is there any hope at removing the word solvable? And the answer is hope, but not theorem. So here's the basics that we know at this point. What we can do is we can prove an isolation theorem similar to the solvable case, but with a very different proof. What we have to do is strengthen the notion of being isolated. In particular, what we had with isolation before was purely a number theory definition. If a prime divided n and another prime power divided n, then basically you wanted to get a unique Celo subgroup and we knew that that meant that q to the k had to be congruent to one mod p with k being zero. That's like a purely number theory thing. But now we have to mix in a little bit of group theory. Because in that regime where there's a little bit of hard number theory and a little bit of hard group theory, they're overlapping. So it's natural that the definition will have an overlap. So on top of being isolated, we're now gonna say a prime is strongly isolated. If whenever there's a non-abelian simple group T whose order divides N, then that prime doesn't divide the order of that simple group. So if the order of PSL27 divides N, then every prime divisor of PSL27 does not get to be strongly isolated. Now that eventually throws out a lot of primes because every prime will occur in some simple group. But the point is that as n gets large, there aren't that many simple groups occurring. And so there aren't that many primes being thrown out. Now that said, proving the density of that starts to tiptoe into the number theory of simple groups. So I leave it as simply as an open question. What is the density? I would conjecture it's still a dense set but this remains to be checked. But at least we now can sort of say what group theory we need out of it. Because when we have strongly isolated, we get a splitting theorem, similar to how we did before, where what we need to do is get a, a normal SIBO subgroup, but now there's an extra condition. So this is 
slightly different than the previous one. The previous one was if it was solvable and isolated, then it was a normal SIBO subgroup. Now, if it's any group and strongly isolated, and the prime is bigger than the two attic valuation, then there's a unique SIBO subgroup. So basically, unless some simple group comes and glues the prime to it, then that prime will show up in an isolated SIBO, unique SIBO subgroup. From that, you get the splitting. The hard and the, and the big go off into separate groups, semi-direct product by Shoy Zazenhaus, and you can start the same inductive breaking up of the problem. Only now, H contains all the simple groups as well as the, um, the other small primes. Turns out all the primes will still be small, but uh, the density is something we don't really know. So here's an aspirational theorem on which I'll basically end. Um, remove the word solvable from the theorem on our first page. We think it's possible, I think it's possible, maybe I won't throw Heiko Dietrich under the bus here. He, he can vote for himself in a minute, but I will say that I believe that in 21 minus some epsilon, we will know if this is true. It, it might not be true, but we will know why it is or isn't true. But given the definition so far, I would speculate that the word solvable is not actually needed in the proof that most group orders have a normal, have a, have a uh, nearly linear time isomorphism test. And I'd even give polynomial time to that. I don't care if we go above linear, um, but to be seen. So with that, I'll um, take any questions and thank you for your time. This is just a summary of the things we've discussed. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, are there questions? Uh, I, I have a question. Go for it, Josh. Um, so in this last bit about uh, speculating about how to extend it beyond solvable. Um, this side here? Yeah. Um, but, but if I understood sort of what you were saying, you were kind of, you were still relying on, like the idea was to still rely on the number theory. Uh, yeah, if you look at the sentence here, it still has most orders. It's not, it's not that, um, so if you look at the word after groups of most orders, we're not trying to say something about group isomorphism in general is easy because that'll swallow up P groups, which I consider to be certainly daunting. Um, right, right. No, but I guess my question is like, um, do you think it's feasible instead of going direct <laughs> to the number theory to think about it in sort of the canon holt style where like, you know, for most orders, well, the solvable radical will also satisfy these number theoretic conditions. And so you can use sort of your algorithm on the solvable radical and then lift canon holt style. Um, I, the, answer, the short answer is I don't think it'll work just canon holt style, but that's also because I haven't thought about that before. So maybe I'm missing the window there, but there's a, there's a sticky bit, um, which is that it's not clear because these aren't constructive isomorphisms, right? They're just decisions of isomorphism. It's not clear that knowing that some quotient was isomorphic lets you glue it together with another piece and verify that it's an isomorphism. So you kind of have to build it as you go in a way that's consistent that you're checking the isomorphisms so that you don't um, leap too far into the future. It seems like most isomorphism tests that do extensions really have to have actual isomorphisms to then check are they compatible when you glue them together. And that may not exist for this type of approach because we've said anything that's big, we just don't have to worry about. But you would have to worry about if you glued them together in the wrong order. So I, I'm not saying it can't happen, but it certainly doesn't come up as a direct application that I can see because of, because of the need to, because of this only one way isomorphism, you have decision without the actual thing, I can't see how to verify the compatibility. Right, right, no, that seems, reasonable, but, right, but then if you work in the weaker model, then that's no longer an issue, like in the Cayley table model. I see, uh, okay, so I see, if, with, with some thought like that, probably it could be strengthened then. Whether that buys you more than what we can do, otherwise I don't, I, I must say, I, mm. I would have to concede I don't know at that point. Um, yeah, thanks. So, but yeah, I, I think that you should be able to build on this all, we are. The point is that there has to be something to look for, and this idea of isolating the H from the B exists with these strongly isolated, but not generally isolated. And 
that may no longer represent most orders. I agree, I'd eat my hat if it didn't represent most orders. You know, simple groups are, tiny simple groups are not that interesting. They don't have that many fantastic primes. So I think somebody who understands the orders of simple groups would probably dispatch this quickly. Um, so whoever on the internet knows that, just write a paper on it and send it to me so that I can move on with my life. So thanks, Josh. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, do you, can you, well, it's, 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 well, because you assume it is true, of course, you don't have a counterexample. Um, I, I find it hard to think of a situation where it wouldn't be true for, where your conjecture wouldn't be true. Yeah, I mean, the problem is there, there aren't many, for example, there's only, I think, the, the groups that have the same order in our, and are not isomorphic simple, that's known. There's only like a couple, uh, I mean, different orders. There's some infant families, but they come in pairs or something. Um, but basically, yeah. what I don't know is a distribution of the prime divisors of simple groups of order less than or equal to n. You know, what's the density of those primes? And um, my, my wager is it's, it's pretty low. But it, I wouldn't have any reason to prove that other than just it feels like that to me. Yeah. You know, eventually PSL gets all the primes. So it's hard to it's hard to rule it out on purely just well PSL never sees the number three you know all the primes show up eventually so how do you know they don't show up too soon is the point you have to sort of prove that your n got bigger before the simple groups got big um, that's a little different question than I know how to answer yeah yeah. Other questions. Okay, can I ask a dumb question? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm often interested in things other than pairwise isomorphism testing. You have a large list of right. So, so yeah. does your approach actually give you a quick way, if you have a large list of groups, that you can do this bound times the number of groups, and that's all you need to determine all the pairs of possible isomorphisms at once as a kind of preferred uh, label for each isomorphism type. Yeah, actually you could. So I didn't, I didn't talk about canonical labels, but yeah. um, the, the, the types of things that we're doing to compare things, they're so tiny yeah. that you're just picking a representative of the thing you want. And you could just pick it Lex least, for example. It's so small, you might as well. And at that point, then you would be a canonical label for the pieces that are in the H. And so I, without, without, you know, really sitting down doing calculation, I'd say, my intuition is yes, you could turn this into a canonical label and then you sort of run your machine and it gives you back some big integer that you store. And if you ever see that integer again, they're equal. That, my guess is that you can turn that into that kind of a, a expression. So that way you can compare several by just hashing and so forth instead of comparing pairwise. Yeah. That's an interesting point that I have not thought about that, but it, it seems very likely. And of course, for most orders, that's all I'm saying. Yeah, most orders. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you throw some P groups in there, well, then the thing just runs out of memory and laughs at you. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, the slides yeah. will be up. If I find mistakes or if you found mistakes, you can tell me and I'll update them. And uh, eventually there'll be a video that you can sort of find all the mistakes on and comment on them. So yeah. have a good weekend, everyone. Yeah, so thank you very much, James, for, for talking. I will stop the recording.